I'm Steve Guterman, and I am the co-owner of a company called Nova Gold. And um, we're here at the Dulles Expo Center for the Capitol Home Show. And we're going to do our version. We call it Appraisal Road Show. And what we're doing is we're going to take a look at people's uh, belongings that they brought for us to appraise today. And I'm going to deal specifically in four areas, which is antique and estate jewelry, coins, precious metals and gems, and last but not least, timepieces. And people are going to bring that which they found in their, in their jewelry boxes, that which they may have inherited, and we'll see what we can do about uh, giving them an idea what it's worth. And when did you start the uh, Appraisal Roadshow? We started the Appraisal Roadshow um, about a year ago. And how's that been going? Oh, it's great. I mean, Steve and I love interacting with the crowd. Um, we love seeing things. We love helping people out. And, uh, you know, this is what we do. We help people when they're downsizing. We help people just find out about their things for curiosity's sake. A lot of times people are inheriting estates. Their mom or dad has died. So we sort of help facilitate the process. How about if we get started? Let's go, Steve. Why don't you go Let's, first? Sounds great. Let's see. Today I'm going to talk about four specific areas with everybody, one of which is antique and estate jewelry. Second will be... Um, gems and precious metals, third is coins, and fourth is timepieces. Why don't I start today with, how about money? Everybody seems to like money, we'll start with that. Love talking about money. Yeah, me too. Wait, considering I have four kids, it doesn't give you a chance to have a lot of it, but that's <laughs> all right, we'll deal with what we have. And you got four coins. <laughs> that's about all that's left. They're very good. When we're discussing money, when we're dealing with money. The main deal is 1964. 1964 and older in the United States is coin silver. And that's why everybody seems to have accumulated that big bag of, of coins and somehow or other that survived every move and every inheritance and everything. And the only thing that survives is that big bag of coins. If it is 90% silver, when we're talking about coins like the Morgan dollars or like the peace dollars, and we don't take into consideration numismatic value, we're looking at something that would trade for approximately $18 a piece. That's not bad. If we're dealing with the half dollars, half dollars, 1964 and older, you're looking at something that would be approximately $6 a piece. The quarters, quarters would be approximately $3, and the dimes would be about a dollar and 20 cents. Anybody have any wheat pennies? We're familiar with wheat pennies? Yeah. Real simple, if you have wheat pennies, 1958 and older, they're worth three cents to one. We're certainly not gonna get rich, but it's certainly a lot of fun. That'll add up. How, yeah. How about, let's say, how about buffalo nickels? Well, everybody has buffalo nickels. Really, really simple. If you can read the date, if you can read the date, they're worth 35 cents. If you cannot read the date, they're worth a dime. <laughs> not, not bad. How about, let's think of something else. What do you think? How about Indian head pennies? Indian head pennies. They can be any place from 40 cents all the way up to several hundred, depending if they're in the 1800s. In the 1800s, you're going to have something that could be well into 150 to 200 dollars. How about what about the steel pennies? How about the steel pennies? Our little war, war pennies. They're 20 cents a piece. That's World War II, right? That's correct. Okay. Yes, yes. And let's see, nickels. Everybody has a bag of nickels. Once a week, somebody brings me a bag of nickels, and they say, "Look, I checked the dates, 1964 and older. Here they are. Here's my bag. How much silver's in that? Do you know how much silver's in that?" You don't know. They're nickels. <laughs> they call them nickels because there is no silver. They're just nickel. <laughs> so th there is none. Now there is an exception. The value to war, the war nickels, 42, 43, 44, and 45, they're worth approximately 80 cents a piece. And then... Steve, do you mind if I ask you a quick question? We talked earlier yes, about I the silver dollar. You do mind? Okay, well, excuse me then. Just wait till the end, sir. 
<laughs> no, you were talking earlier about the silver dollars and the half dollars and the quarters and the dimes. It, right. And I think the value you were quoting there was based on the silver content, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, that's correct. We're so not, given that, do you recommend right now that people, do you think it's a good time to sell your coins or a bad time? Like, what would you advise somebody? I can tell you this. I've been doing this since 1980. Okay, so since 1980, so I've been doing, I guess, what's that, 34 years? All right. In 34 years, when people ask me, what do I do about gold or silver? And they say, is this a good time to buy or a good time to sell? I have sold everything that we put together, and we did this several months ago. We believe that gold and silver are going way down. Now, that being the case, remember, every time that someone sells, someone else buys. So someone thinks that I, I sold at the wrong time. Uh, if you take my track record, and considering that I've been doing this for 34 years, I certainly have the trends together. I certainly understand, I certainly, I would say, better than average knowledge of the coins. I have a long, long, long track record of always being wrong. <laughs> 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 yeah, so certainly if I had a crystal ball, I, I, that'd be great, but I don't. Uh, you know, do I think it's a good time? I believe it's a good time to sell. Because in uh, general, gold. silver and gold are historically high right now. Right I know now, they've yeah. gone down in the last year, but if we compared it to, say, um, in the 1930s when you were in high school. <laughs> well, that's in high school. <laughs> stop, stop. So let, let's move on to and, uh, something else. How about the mint sets? Does anyone have the mint sets? I can usually tell how many grandchildren someone has by the mint sets. You can, I can tell when they were born. I can say... There is no great premium on any of these sets. There is no shortage. Uh, if you, you, you want them as collectibles or if you have you know, some relative that uh, you don't particularly care for, you could give it to them. It would be a nice gift to give them and tell them very valuable sets. Please don't do anything with them. I think that's probably the best thing to do with them. Other than that, I think we... Oh, oh let's talk about gold coins. Does anyone have gold coins? How about a $20 gold piece? We know what the $20 gold piece is? $20 gold piece, which is 20 bucks when it was originally minted, was the original United States one ounce gold piece. So today it'd be worth $1,217. If you have the $10 gold piece, what do you think that is? Come on, it's not that early in the morning. If, if $20 is the one ounce, what do we think the $10 is? All right, I'll give it to you. A half an ounce, very good. And if it's a $5 gold piece, it would be the quarter of an ounce. And if it is the two and a half dollar gold piece, it's the eighth of an ounce. So long term, it's proven to be pretty decent. Um, it certainly has been a decent hedge on inflation. Um, we are a gold-based stand standard uh, country, so it's a good hedge. Other than that, why don't we let you take over there, Todd? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Todd Peenstra. Um, I am originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. I grew up there. And in 2005, I moved up here with my family. And I currently live in Annapolis, Maryland. And I live up here. I have three boys. I have my wife, and then I have an eight-year-old boy. I have a five-year-old boy, and I have a two-year-old boy. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank everybody for getting me out of the house today. Because uh, believe me, it, you think it's loud here? Sir, go to my house right now. It's twice as loud at my house. <laughs> trust, trust me, it is. So thanks for getting me out of the house. Now, how do you guys interact with me? There's three ways. Number one is estates. If someone in your family dies, I will help you settle the estate. Number two, when you're downsizing. A lot of people are maybe going from multiple homes to one or maybe you're older, like Steve, and you're gonna getting ready to move into a retirement community, um, and you need to downsize. Or maybe you've just inherited, a lot of times you might be an only child, and you've just inherited things from the family, and now the house is bursting at the gills, and you gotta figure it out. So we help people downsize. The third thing is insurance. When people are updating their insurance, we help them with that. Now, when we go in a house, and we're gonna see this today, we're gonna have some fun, with some of these items here, what do we do? We do three things. Number one, we identify it. What is it, how old is it, where is it from? Number two, what's it worth? Now let's talk real quick about what it's worth. There's wholesale and retail. And I know that that sounds simplistic, but I can't tell you how many times 
someone will come to me and say, Todd, I want to know what this chair is worth. And I'll say, well, do you want to keep it or do you want to sell it? And they'll say to me, I just want to know what it's worth. And the thing is, it depends on what you want to do. Let me illustrate that really quick. And I know this is a simple concept, but it seems like some people don't always understand it. Sir, I see you're wearing a Redskins cap. Now, yeah. So I will bet that gentleman probably paid $50, $60 for the cap when it was new. No, he probably got, he probably got given to him as a present. Um, but let's assume he bought that cap for $50. Now, if he takes it off his head and says, how much will someone give me for it? You're not going to get the $50 that you spent at the store, right? You're going to get less money. Mm -hmm. It depends on if they win or lose tomorrow as to how much money he's going to get. Or, or if we can have Kirk Cousins sign it. Right. There you go. <laughs> but you guys get the point is that there's what you can sell it for is wholesale and then there's retail. Wholesale, a general rule of thumb is wholesale you can sell it for about 40% of retail. If you take that number, that's about where you're going to be every time. Now there's exceptions, but in general if you use a 40% rule, you'll be in the ballpark. So with that sort of foundation, why don't we get started? What's your name, sir? Tom Kupiak. Tom, tell us the story of your chair. Well, my uh, aunt owned it for almost 50 or 60 years. She died about a couple years ago. And Tom, I inherited again, again, the, the estate. Uh, the chair from the records I saw, she bought it in 1968, a set of six of them. And it's a 1740, and she bought it from an auction house in uh, New York. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. You can have a seat, sir. All right, so what we have here is we just to uh, go over what Tom told us. We have a mahogany Chippendale chair from the 18th century, made in the 1700s. Um, someone in his family bought it in 1968 and paid a couple of three, how much was $3,800, $3,800 in 1968, which if you think about that, that's a lot of money in 1968. Um, that's probably the equivalent today of about ten dollars or $12,000, if you did the math on it. So when I look at this chair, in any antique, in order to have really good value, we have to have three things. Number one, we want it to be beautiful. It has to have beauty. Now, when we look at this chair, it's quite pretty. Chippendale was known. He's one of the greatest designers of furniture in the world. So when we look at the legs, the cabriole legs, and we look at the back, and the back splat, and the carving, it's quite beautiful. I think we could all appreciate that and agree with it. All right, so that's the first element. The second element is we want to have rarity. Now we ask ourselves, is this rare? Now if we were talking about a chair, a Chippendale style chair from 1940, or even 1880, that wouldn't be nearly as rare as this one because they've reproduced Chippendale style chairs for 200 years. But the fact of the matter is, this is a period Chippendale chair. This is of the period. In other words, this was made during Chippendale's life. So it is a very rare chair. Now, we have one more element that we need to really hit a grand slam with value, and that is demand. There have to be people that really want to buy it. You can have the first two elements, but if you don't have demand, you're not going to have a whole lot of value. In fact, if you have demand, you really don't need the other two. A good example of that, who remembers Beanie Babies? You remember that? Well, they weren't rare, and I think you could argue they weren't really that pretty, but because of the demand, they, they, you, know, you could sell them. So let's go back to the chair. The problem that you're going to run into with this chair is that the demand for this type of furniture is way down. I can't really give you a good reason why, but if you look at people under the age of 50, they're not buying things like this. They're not buying English furniture, and they're not buying formal furniture. Most young people, like, you know, I put my wife in this category, you have kids, you have wide open spaces, and it's not formal. It's a very informal style of living. So given that, sir, I would say to you this. If you were trying to sell the chairs, you could probably sell them. I'm going to do it on a per chair basis. You could sell them for about $1,500 each. So that would be your wholesale. So your wholesale on the chairs, if I'm doing my math right, is $9,000. Six times 1,500. Mm -hmm. Now we would triple that number if you said to me, okay, I'm just gonna keep it and insure it. I would insure the chairs at about 
$4,500 a piece. So now we're talking about, so we're getting somewhere around $30,000 is what you would want to insure them for and guard against fire or theft. So those are your numbers. And I want to thank you because these are really nice chairs. A round of applause. Really nice, Tom. And from here on out, ma'am, we're going to applaud people based on their attractiveness, okay? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned period pieces. While we're talking about period pieces, let's talk about antique versus estate. And in jewelry, there's a, there is a separation. Do we know what it is? What's the difference between antique versus estate? No idea. Age. Uh, if something is 100 years old, it is an antique. If it is bought this morning from a, from a, a mall jeweler and brought home, or whether or not it is a signed Tiffany piece that is 99 years and 364 days, they are both have the designation of being an estate piece. To help you guys out with that, think of Steve as the antique and I'm the estate piece. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to let the lack of maturity <laughs> enter into this at all. <laughs> so, I'm just trying to help them out, Steve. I appreciate, so can... appreciate that. So in, in any case, it does not have anything at all to do with value. It is just a measurement of time. 100 years, antique. Anything less, estate piece. But what does give it value? Todd had mentioned it. He said, period piece, recognized periods, because recognized periods have collectors. And we're, I guess we're familiar with, what would be the, the one where, we, I guess we start with probably the Victorian, Victorian era? Mm -hmm, and the that's Victorian a big one. era. Alicia, you know when the Victoria period was, right? Right, that was the 67 year reign of Queen Victoria from, what did you say, 1834 to 1901? You were absolutely correct, very good. Okay, and after the Victorian period, the next recognized period would be towards the latter part of the 1800s, and that would be the uh, French influence, the Art Nouveau period for the last few years of the um, 1800s, and then we rolled right into the early 1900s, which are a lot of people have the pieces that they've inherited, the little platinum and the filigree and the pearl and the diamond pieces, and that is the Edwardian period, and it was seven year period uh, from 1901 to 1908. After that is probably the most recognizable period of all, and that is the art, art, Deco, very good, the Art Deco, and that's just before the war. And then right after the war, we have the Art Retro period, where everything kind of looked like a big bicycle chain. And then after that is the branded pieces of today. We have a piece that was brought in today from Alicia. Alicia, can I embarrass you a little bit and bring you up? Here you go. Come on up, oh. and we'll talk. So, hold it up close to me. So what yeah. did you bring? Well, this is a diamond watch that my mother-in-law, I think, inherited from her mother. Okay. And so that was in the early, the turn of the century, I think, or just after. Okay. I would agree with you. Thank you very much. Let me talk about it. We have, it's a really pretty piece. The piece itself is probably the definition of the deco period, and this is a 19... 20s piece. You can tell because of the cut of the diamonds inside. Um, it is also 14 karat uh, white gold, which is also period part of the period. The face teeny, 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 teeny tiny, and it does not have any recognizable name. In fact, it's not. There's no name on it at all. The band, although, is exactly what they used to do at that period of time. This is not original because the band itself is gold filled. So it had been replaced at some period in time. Moment of truth, yes, what's I it did. worth? Would you mind? If you were trying to sell this piece, I'm going to put the piece as a deco piece because this collectors someplace in the neighborhood of um, about 1500 to 2000 If you were trying to insure it, I would insure it for about $5,000. Fantastic piece. Thank you very much. So Evelyn, tell us about your paintings. Uh, they are from in the estate. Uh, they're all antiques. 
and they're from the uh, Ants Estate, and she's had them um, probably about, I think she purchased them in the 60s uh, from dealers in New York. Okay. So the 60s were a good decade for your aunt, apparently. Absolutely. Yes. She was a world traveler and bought a lot of Absolutely. nice things. Yes. What did your aunt do, by the way? I mean, because it, it seems like she had a lot of antiques. What well, was by then she had retired. Um, she had a pretty lucrative career with the CIA. Is this coming out? And had moved to um, Maryland to retire. And she had traveled all over the place and did a lot of investing and purchasing of antiquities. Now that's pretty impressive because to work for the CIA in the middle 20th century, that's Absolutely. not as commonplace as it is today, so she must have been quite brilliant. I'd like to think so. Yeah. All right, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. All right, guys, so let's, so let's talk about, I'm going to put this painting down for just a second, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about wall art. Now, we talked earlier about, thanks, Zibby. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you for your help. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, we talked earlier about you have to have three elements. You have to have beauty, rarity, and demand, right, to have really good value. Now, people are always asking me, where can I make money? Sometimes they have medical bills or they need to sell something. Paintings offer you the biggest opportunity to make more money than anything else out there because people, if it's the right artist and the right subject, people are willing to pay just about anything. Um, the sky's the limit. I mean, the world record at any auction that you go to is always for a painting. Um, by the way, I'm going to hold this up and let you guys look at it. What do you guys think the top three subjects of painting are all time selling? Number three, what do you think it is? That's exactly right, sir, in the Redskins cap. It is a landscape. Landscapes are very popular. What's the second most selling popular? What do you guys think? What was that? Portraits, no, but it's close. It's a beautiful woman. People always want to have a beautiful woman in their house. Take that man, for example, you can tell. All right, number one, number one, best selling, what do you think it is? What'd you say, ma'am? Abstracts, no, but that's close. It's a naked, beautiful woman. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, so, what we have here, let's take these paintings in order. So, I'm just going to start with this one. This is a landscape. And it is signed by the artist. Now I've got to get my notes out. Um, this one, this one is signed by Henry Pope. Now the biggest factor in a painting is not the subject and not the size, but who is the artist. Henry Pope was an English artist from the 1800s. He was born in 1837. This painting right now, if you guys wanted to sell it, it's $800 wholesale. And we would triple that number, $2,500 retail or insurance value. Now, why am I tripling the number? Because there's nothing more fun than ripping off an insurance company, right? No, I'm not doing it for that reason, sir. I'm doing it because if you did have something happen to this painting and you had to buy another one, you'd have to go to an art dealer. And the art dealer is going to charge you $2,500. A lot of people don't know this, but over 70% of all the, when you see an auction and, and what's sold at auction, those are dealers buying those things and they're reselling them. Seventy percent of everything that's sold in an auction is resold. So when you see an auction result, that's closer to wholesale than retail. So this is a $2,500 painting in a store. That's why you would need the insurance value of that. Now let's take this larger painting right here. This is, um, this is an artist, it's an American artist from the 19th century, Foxcroft Cole. And what a coincidence, his name is Foxcroft in the back. It's not, I've never heard that name before in my life. So what we have here is a beautiful landscape, and I think, is that children? Is it some children under some trees, isn't that pretty? I think we could all agree that's pretty. What about the hole? I'm gonna address that in a second. It does have some damage, you guys can see it has damage in the top of it, and we'll talk about that in a second. But let's, let's assume that the painting was not damaged. So we have a painting signed by Foxcroft Cole. Okay, again, I, I did the research earlier. So this painting, if you guys wanted to sell it, you could sell it for $1,500. That would be your wholesale on it. And the retail on it would be about $5,000. I would insure it for $5,000. Now, that's assuming it was perfect. We saw the hole in it. So I'm going to... The hole is up in the corner, it's not in the middle, that helps it a little bit. 
To get that repaired would probably cost you $1,000. So I'm going to adjust the value $1,000. So take $1,000 of those values I just gave you. So in the present condition, you could sell it for $500 and you would insure it for about $3,500, $4,000. Now, if you guys need someone to repair it, um, Steve and I can give you a recommendation of, of who does it. And that's what we try to do. We try to be answer people for people. If you guys come to us, you need to repair, you need something shipped, we'll try to get you in touch with the right people. Thank you. Fantastic. Should we Let's talk about silver and precious metals for a little bit. First of all, everybody has the flatware sets that we've been inheriting, the sterling silver sets that we've been in, and the tea sets, and I guess jewelry. First of all, I'm looking for three things with silver. The first one is the word sterling, which means the numerical, which would be 925 because it's 92 and a half percent pure silver okay and if i don't see either one of those two there's a third that i like to look for has anyone ever seen a lion on some of your your pieces a lion if the lion is on four legs if he's on four legs it's 95 percent pure if the lion is holding up one paw so he's on three legs it's sterling silver, 92.5% pure. If the lion is standing up, like Todd and me, on two legs, it is silver plate. Silver plate. People bring me silver plate all the time, and they're curious, why is it worth so little? If we took every building and every uh, house, any structure in, Chantilly, and we flattened it, and we decided that we were going to plate it. We would use approximately one ounce. So it's just trace, trace, trace amounts of silver. So um, what do we have? So let's just review that. Four legs is 95%, fantastic. Uh, two legs is plate, and three is very, very good. And what was that? Pardon? No, don't talk about that. If he's laying down smoking a cigarette, what are you talking about? No, we don't do that. Right. Okay. So let's talk, let's talk it through. We have uh, pieces here. And it's a nice set. It's really, I'm going to, we're going to go through the three elements that Todd was talking about. First of all, could we say beauty? Yeah, I, I think, think we can pretty. Yeah. Rare, not so nah. much. When I turn it over, I notice that it says Rogers. Rogers is a plate company. Being that it's a plated set, we know how much actual silver's on this. It's certainly pretty, it's kind of pretty enough, but what would you pay for it? I mean, we see these all the time. Would you pay? 75 bucks for the set it's kind of a lot of money all right so anything that's plate it's more decorative enjoy it for your house i think that that's what i would do with the set um it certainly might have some more value uh we love doing these shows and you know the capital home show is a fantastic show but they're not paying us so if it'd be okay i'm just going to open this up if you have any change, if you would just put your stick. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding with you all. <laughs> I'll take that cap, sir. Yeah, <laughs> take the cap. Four bucks. What Fantastic. do you say, four bucks or yeah, 20 bucks? Four, four bucks. <laughs> Even I can afford that. Go ahead, that. Todd. You all pick right. It up. Um, let's talk about this charger. Evelyn, do you want to come up again? Evelyn, you did such a good job last time. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 that we're going to do this again. Now, Evelyn, I'm going to hazard a guess. This is that same crazy Ann from the CIA bought this charger. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she bought it in the 60s. Yes. And do we know what she paid for it? Uh, 175. Okay. And do we know where she bought it? Um, in New York? In New York. New York. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. 
Now you guys, before I talk specifically about the charger, I'm going to give you all some pointers that you can take home with you, some generalizations about ceramics and porcelain. When you turn a porcelain upside down, you want to, that's going to tell us two things. It's going to tell us, hopefully, who made it. But we can also date it by that mark. And here's how you date it. If it doesn't have a country of origin on it, it's made before 1890. Because before 1890, they didn't put countries. They would just put the manufacturer name, if anything. Now, in 1890, they started to put the country like England, United States. So if it just says the country, it's from 1890 to 1920. So think turn of the century. Now, after 1920, they changed it again to put made in. So if we see made in the United States, made in England, it's made after 1920. Now, that's a general rule of thumb that you can follow. So what we hope is that when you turn something over, it doesn't say anything on it. Now, I turn this one over, and it says, property of Dulles Expo Center. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that, sir. It doesn't say anything. All right, so that's good. Now, when I look at this, this has all of the elements of being an 18th century piece. It was made from the 1700s. It's in what we would call an Imari pattern. Now, Imari is a general catchphrase for a lot of patterns that sort of have these, this general geometric pattern and these general colors. Uh, so this would be called the Imari pattern, and I believe it's Japanese. So, given our three elements, do we have beauty? Yes. Do we have rarity? Yes. Now we ask ourselves, is there a demand for this? And believe it or not, with Japanese and Asian from the 18th century, the demand is pretty good right now. So with this, there would be a demand. So Evelyn, bottom line on your charger, because there is quite a demand for this. If you wanted to sell it, you could sell it for about $1,000. If you're going to keep it and you want to insure it, let's insure it for $2,500. Now that being said, I know Steve tried this before, but I don't think he was ambitious enough. We're going to pass this around. Yeah, if better, you guys could uh, fill this up with your paper money, yeah. your coin. <laughs> no, okay. Steve, it's all you. Okay. I have a little diamond ring. I say little, not that the stone's little, just that it's small compared to the size of everything else that we've been looking at today. The diamond ring is in a platinum mounting, and the stone itself is, is called an old mine cut stone. And it's a European cut stone, literally cut around the turn of the century, right around late 1800s, early 1900. Has an ice cream cone tab uh, table at the top. And if you look right in the middle, it looks like there's a hole in the middle of the stone. There's no hole, it's just that they lack the technology to cut to a point. So they used to cut them flat. This is, from the size that I've gauged it, it looks like it's slightly under a carat. Normally, 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 we take these European cut stones and we would recut them. We cut this small, we give it a smaller table, more pronounced crown angles, and bring it to the point. But that, we will lose approximately 20 to 30% of the weight when we recut. That, of course, would do, give a, a huge hit to the value because you'd have to look at it as about a three-quarter carat instead of a, almost a carat stone. However, all of a sudden, the last 10 years, we're noticing that these old uh, minor cuts and the European yes. cuts and the transitional yes. cuts, there's a whole group of people that all they want are these old stones. And the reason is for two reasons. Number one, it seems as if everybody's fairly socially, socially conscious these days. You know, it's kind of a green environment. Everybody wants to recycle and make sure that they're using things over and over. And certainly a way to um, help out the, the world is not to spend and have to go through mining two tons of stone to get one one carat uh, stone that would be able to be used for jewelry. And two, there's another group that is concerned about the situation in how they were mined with the blood diamonds in South Africa. So the way to uh, make sure that it certainly was not taken, that people were not taken advantage of and that they were not through the um, underground is that you make sure that they are European cut stones when it was run by the cartel. 
So, all of a sudden, these are in huge demand. So we don't want to cut it at all. In fact, on the contrary, that, that'll actually destroy a bunch of the value. What is it worth today? The color happens to be nice, pretty white stone. The clarity is beautiful inside of it. I've already taken a look with a loop, so there's very slight imperfections. And it's certainly nothing visible to the naked eye. If I was doing, if we were trying to insure this, I would insure this piece for about five to six thousand dollars. If you were trying to sell it, I'd figure you're gonna get about half of that. Fantastic piece, thank you very much. All right, who brought this? Come on up. Hi. Now you'll need to hold it really close. Remember we did this, okay. Hi, What's your Tom. name? What's your name? Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? This is a piece that was handed down from my great, great grandmother who came from England to Australia gave it to my great-grandmother, who gave it to my mother, who gave it to me. So we can trace it back at least three generations. Right. Now, did she buy it in Australia? Do you know, did, do we know where they got it? In England, I have no idea where. I think they got it in England. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, folks. So what we have here is a piece of acid etched, what we call art glass. Now, the two most famous names in art glass our class was started to be made around 1870, 1880. The two most famous names in the United States, it's a man called Louis Comfort Tiffany. We've all heard of Tiffany. And in France, it was Emile Gallet. Those were the two big names. Now, why did Tiffany start to make glass like this? Real quick, it's an interesting story. Tiffany collected ancient glass that had been Roman glass and Greek glass that had been buried for thousands of years. If you've ever seen old glass that's been buried and you dig it up, it has an iridescence to it. Um, sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's blue, and it's just the way that it's reacted to the soil. So Tiffany collected that glass and it occurred to him that he wanted to make that commercially so he could sell it. So he challenged his craftsmen to do that and it took him about a decade and they started to make what they called the first was gold. They called it gold iridescent glass or faville glass was their name for it. Then they started to do blues and then they started to decorate it. You can see it's etched with this very Art Nouveau sort of almost like a vine is growing over the glass. So this dates 1880 to 1910. Now we turn it over, there is no signature on the bottom of it. So it's probably not a Tiffany. Now it could be. But Tiffany generally signed about 95% of his pieces. So there were some other makers. Lotz, L-O-E-T-Z, was one. Quizel, Q-U-E-Z-A-L, was another one. A third one was Steuben. And all of these men worked at one time for Tiffany, then went off on their own and started making their own glass. I believe this is a Quizel or a Lotz art glass vase. So if you want to sell it, I think you could get about $700 for it if you wanted to sell it because it's very decorative, it's in really good condition. And if you keep it and you want to insure it, I would insure it at $2,250. Very nice. Thank you for bringing it. How much time do we have? We're good. We Ten minutes? We're good. Yeah, I okay. think I can do one more. I think you can do one more. And I think we're in five minutes? Time. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> I'll let Steve, I'll let I'll, you do your otherwise piece. Otherwise we're encroaching. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. You do your okay. piece and we'll wrap it let up. Let me move on quick. Then we've talked about we had a chance to talk about antique and estate jewelry. We've talked about uh, timepieces. We've talked about precious metals. What we haven't talked about are the timepieces. Timepieces. Best no I guess the the greatest value in the world, the, the most expensive timepieces are Pate Philippe. Pate Philippe is a French watchmaker born in 1843. Um, you can purchase watches today. They can, uh, you can actually buy a handmade watch. It would cost you one and a half million dollars. That would make a very nice gift for me. We're not going to see <laughs> that. All right, after that, there's a group of, uh, second, of watches on the secondary market that have a lot of value. The, the most well-known would be, would be Rolex, very good. After Rolex would be Beaumassier, Piaget, 
uh, the Vicherons, the, what do you have, Cartier, any of these branded names, there's a very fluid market for it, so demand is high. I'm holding here a woman's uh, Rolex, and it is in fantastic condition. It is actually a model from the 90s, early 90s. It is the two-tone, the 18 karat, and stainless. If you are trying to put a, uh, an insurance value on it, the insurance value would be approximately $6,000. If you were trying to sell it, you could see approximately $3,100 or $3,200 for it. It's a great piece. Um, aside from these branded pieces, everybody has pocket watches. We assume that everybody's collected the pocket watches. The pocket watches typically make sure they're running. If they're not running, a lot of times the cure is worse than the disease. You can spend three, four hundred dollars and end up with a watch that's worth three, four hundred dollars. Um, if they are gold, usually with the Waldhams, the uh, Hamiltons, the Elgins, the uh, any of the the second tier watches, typically speaking, there is no great secondary market unless they are in tremendous, tremendous, tremendous condition. So. Generally, the value is in the gold. The movements were not particularly great movements. They're easy to, you know, and, and they were mass produced. Um, does anyone ever see the railroad watches? The railroad watches, the big railroad watches. And if you look on it, on the back of it, it'll say 18 carat or 14 carat. Usually when we test them, they're zero carat. And do you know why? We refer to them as depression watches. They were, they were famous during the Depression. No one had any money at all. So what we did was they would take them and they would double and triple plate them and put big 18 karat so that everybody would think that you were walking around with a bunch of money. But the answer, the truth is, they were just plate and not worth a lot. Folks, it has been a lot of fun. Now listen, let me ask you guys a question before we wrap it up, Steve. <laughs> you go right ahead. We've talked about a lot of things here, right? We get demand and beauty. What do you guys think the most important thing that we told you guys today, the most important piece of advice, most important information that I gave you? What's that? Get it appraised. That would be I second. Like that one. We that the thing. first one is, I have three kids, ma'am. I have an eight-year-old, I have a five-year-old, and I have a two-year-old. I need your business because i got to feed those guys. So please, take our numbers. Remember us, Appraisal Roadshow, Steve Guterman. And Todd Peenstra, thank you very much. Thank you.